Good morning. How are you today? Nice to see you. Hello, and welcome to worship at St Mungo's. Hello, how are you? Hello, welcome to today's service. Lord of life, we come to you. Lord of all, our Saviour be. Come to bless and to heal with the light of your love. Lord of life, we come to you. Lord of all, our Saviour be. Come to bless and to Welcome to St Mungo's. We take up once more Jacob's story in Genesis. Here's the story so far. Jacob has fallen into the hands of Laban, his wily uncle, who is keen to take advantage of him. It's a lesson to Jacob, who has always relied on being more of a trickster than other people. Through his experience, Jacob is humbled and begins to look to God and God's promises to be with him. Now God begins to act for Jacob and his growing family. Let us worship God. Let us pray. God our Father, we praise you that you are at work through history and through a people called for a special purpose. You are the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. We praise you that when the time was right, you sent Jesus, as you promised long ago through your prophets, and that this good news is written for us in the Bible. We thank you that there is forgiveness and new life offered to all who turn from their own way of doing things and trust themselves to him. 
We praise you that you've given us an open Bible and people to translate it and make it available to more and more people. We thank you for giving your Holy Spirit to be at work in us and in all who believe. Come to us again today. Speak to our hearts. Make us aware of your love. Cleanse our consciences. Focus our minds and shape our thinking. Lead us in the way of Jesus, who is himself, the way, the truth and the life. Amen. Today is taken from Genesis chapter 30, reading from verse 25. This is taken from the message. After Rachel had had Joseph, Jacob spoke to Laban, Let me go back home. Give me my wives and children for whom I've served you. You know how hard I've worked for you. Laban said, If you please, I have learned through divine inquiry that God has blessed me because of you. He went on, so name your wages, I'll pay you. Jacob replied, you know well what my work has meant to you and how your livestock has flourished under my care. The little you had when I arrived has increased greatly. Everything I did resulted in blessings for you. Isn't it about time that I do something for my own family? So what should I pay you? Jacob said, you don't have to pay me a thing. But how about this? I will go back to pasture and care for your flocks. Go through your entire flock today and take out every speckled or spotted sheep, every dark-coloured lamb, every spotted or speckled goat. They will be my wages. That way you can check on my honesty when you assess my wages. If you find any goat that's not speckled or spotted, or a sheep that's not black, you will know that I stole it. Fair enough, said Laban, it's a deal. 
But that very day, Laban removed all the mottled and spotted belly goats, and all the speckled and spotted nanny goats. Every animal that even had a touch of white on it, plus all the black sheep, and placed them under the care of his sons. Then he put a three-day journey between himself and Jacob. Meanwhile, Jacob went on tending what was left of Laban's flock. But Jacob got fresh branches from poplar, almond and plane trees and peeled the bark, leaving white stripes on them. He stuck the peeled branches in front of the watering troughs where the flocks came to drink. When the flocks were in heat, they came to drink and mated in front of the street branches. Then they gave birth to young that were streaked or spotted or speckled. Jacob placed the ewes before the dark-coloured animals of Laban. That way, he got distinctive flocks for himself, which he didn't mix with Laban's flocks. And when the sturdier animals were mating, Jacob placed branches at the troughs in view of the animals, so that they mated in front of the branches. But he wouldn't set up the branches before the feebler animals. That way the feeble animals went to Laban and the sturdy ones to Jacob. So the man got richer and richer, acquiring huge flocks, lots and lots of servants, not to mention camels and donkeys. Jacob learned that Laban's sons were talking behind his back. Jacob had used our father's wealth to make himself rich at our expense. At the same time, Jacob noticed that Laban had changed toward him. He wasn't treating him the same. That's when God said to Jacob, Go back home where you were born. I'll go with you. So Jacob sent word for Rachel and Leah to meet him out in the field where his flocks were. He said, I notice that your father has changed toward me. He doesn't treat me the same as before. But the God of my father hasn't changed. He's still with me. You know how hard I've worked for your father. Still your father has treated me over and over, changing my wages time and again. But God never let him really hurt me. If he said, your wages will consist of speckled animals, the whole flock would start having speckled lambs and kids. And if he said, from now on, your wages will be streaked animals, the whole flock would have streaked ones. Over and over, God used your father's livestock to reward me. Once, while the flocks were mating, I had a dream and saw the billy goats, all of them streaked, speckled and mottled, mounting their mates. In the dream, an angel of God called out to me, Jacob. I said, yes. He said, watch closely. Notice that all the goats in the flock that are mating are streaked, speckled and mottled. I know what Laban's been doing to you. I'm the God of Bethel, where you consecrated a pillar and made a vow to me. Now be on your way. Get out of this place. Go home to your birthplace. Amen.
Perhaps it's now time for Jacob to move on. It's about 14 years since Jacob arrived, almost penniless, at his uncle's home. He spent these years as a sort of bond servant. He's a family member by blood and by marriage, but he's in debt slavery to pay off what he owes. To enable Jacob to pay what's called the bride price for two wives. The bride price, despite the obnoxious name, was supposed to provide security for women. If their husband dies or divorces them, their father has the means to support them. For Laban, this is all in the form of work done for his sheep and goat business, and that's where it's gone. Read on in the next chapter to find out more about that. Laban hasn't bothered to ring fence this fund, to make sure there is money for his daughters. For Laban, it really seems to be some kind of a sale, and his daughters know it. When Jacob gets round to talking with them, they tell Jacob that they might as well be strangers to their father, as he's more interested in profit than family love. Jacob knows this. Laban's already deceived him. And when Joseph is born, the much longed for child, Raben, uh, Rachel's firstborn, it only stirs up Jacob's discontent with the situation. Jacob says to Laban, let me go back home. Give me my wives and children for whom I've served you. You know how hard I've worked for you. Laban's worried. He's about to lose his greatest business asset. So Laban begins to smooth talk Jacob. Laban says, I've learned through divine inquiry that God has blessed me because of you. Now Laban is an old pagan using fortune telling. He's not a worshipper of the Lord. But this might be just an excuse because Laban wants to keep Jacob working for him, not because he loves him, but because he's useful. And so the negotiation begins. Jacob states his value to Laban, a value not properly acknowledged until now. You know well what my work has meant to you and how your livestock has flourished under my care. The little you had when I arrived has increased greatly. Everything I did resulted in blessings for you. Isn't it about time that I do something for my own family? Laban gets straight to the point, the bottom line. So what should I pay you? And Jacob's answer is a bit surprising. You don't have to pay me a thing. However, he has in mind a profit sharing agreement. I'll continue to take care of your flocks if you agree to this suggestion. Go through your entire flock today and take out every speckled or spotted sheep, every dark coloured lamb, every spotted or speckled goat. They'll be my wages. And Laban says, it's a deal. However, Laban goes through the flocks that day himself and takes out all the sheep and goats with a variegated colour and ships them off where Jacob can't get them. That leaves Jacob with the normally all whitish greyish sheep and the all black goats. If Laban was alive today, he would probably have an offshore bank account where he could squirrel away all his money. The trouble is that Laban is alive today. He's not called Laban. He goes under many names. He's an employer or a teacher, a neighbour or a work colleague, even sometimes someone in your own family. And this is what he or she might be like. Laban is controlling and manipulative. He uses you for his own ends. He's really a ruthless bully he takes advantage of your weaker position. He prizes wealth over people. Laban sells his daughters and doesn't provide for them. 
He's detached and unemotional. If you value things over people, that's what you become. As Jesus said, your heart will be where your treasure is. And worst of all, he's in a position of power. There are people who use power well for the benefit of others, and there are people who don't. If you have a Laban in your life, sometimes through a union or the law or someone else who can stand up for you, you can get justice, and if you can, get it. But sometimes because all the power is in Laban's hands, it seems as if you can't. That's what living under Laban is like. There are stories of companies, workplaces, schools and even families where Uncle Laban is in charge. You can try, of course, living like Jacob. Jacob always had a cunning wheeze, a way of trying to get the better of someone else. And if it works, it usually backfires as well. He has what seems like a good idea now. He peels sticks and puts them in the water trough uh, when the f animals are in heat, or he makes them look at the stripy animals or the black feast animals in the breeding season. The idea seems to be, though the text doesn't actually say this, that the visual stimulation will lead to the birth of the kind of animals he wants. Now, that's not likely to work. The trouble is, according to the story, it seems to work. Though again, the storyteller doesn't actually say that Jacob's cunning wheeze is the reason. Well, why does it work? There are potential scientific explanations and there is a theological explanation. First of all, the science bit. The strong animals that Jacob chooses are likely hybrid animals who carry a recessive gene which shows itself in future generations. Or it could be, though it's a minority suggestion, that there's some biochemical agent in the strip bark and the stimulant leaks into the water supply. We shouldn't really expect Genesis to give us modern science. It's not written in that context. On the other hand, ancient peoples would have known something about animal breeding. And I, whose training is not in either, in either science or animal husbandry, had better say no more about it. I said I'd give a theological explanation as well. You see, Jacob is not just living under Laban or living on his own wits. Jacob is living under God. That's what we saw in the last two weeks, even in, in this unhappy, dysfunctional family. God is at work. When the Lord saw that Leah was unloved, he did something. And last week, God remembered Rachel and he did something. That's one of the great themes of Genesis. Even when everything's going from bad to worse, God is at work. God in justice and mercy has allowed the con man Jacob to feel what life is like under another unscrupulous con man. And God is now moving to bring restorative justice to Jacob, because this is the God who is just and the God who is merciful, the God who loves Jacob, even though Jacob doesn't realise how much yet. It's also because this is a family with a promise from God and with faith in that promise. God intends to bless all the families of the earth, not only through their experience of God, but ultimately through Jesus, their legal descendant, bringing people into Abraham's bigger family, the Church of the Messiah. But Jacob is not just living under Laban or living on his own wits. Jacob is living under God. 
But why does God sometimes take so long to do something about bad situations? Why does it sometimes take years and years? Well, I don't know. But I know that Jesus tells us to keep praying and not to give up. Jesus told a story about a poor widow and a judge, a judge with no respect for God or people. The widow kept coming to the judge and pleading with him, make things right for me, someone is doing me wrong. Widows were a target for exploitation in those days. And he refused at first, but eventually he gave in. Why? He said, this widow keeps bothering me, so I'll see that things are made right for her. If I don't, she'll do my head in by coming again and again. That's the very selfish reason of an unfair judge. And Jesus contrasts it with how God is, who is very fair and has concern for his own. God's chosen people cry out to him day and night. Won't he make things right for them? Will he keep putting them off? I tell you, God will see that things are made right for them. He will make sure it happens quickly. But when the Son of Man comes, will he find people on earth who have faith? James, also in his letter, is communicating with people in his world. Rich merchants and farmers who either thought that we're alone with our wits and our own abilities or that God didn't care. We'll do this, we'll go there, we'll make money. They didn't take God into account. And James also spoke on behalf of those who felt that God didn't care about their plight, exploited by others. You have not paid any wages to those who work in your fields. Listen to their complaints. The cries of those who gather in your crops have reached the ears of God, the Lord Almighty. And James speaks of the day that Jesus speaks of, the day of the Lord. Be patient then, my brothers and sisters, he says, until the Lord comes. But sometimes, as with Jacob, God acts before that day. I know of a person who was very upset. His, his work was going downhill because of a Laban in his life. And he spoke to his mother and she prayed about it and said, if it's really too hard to bear, God will remove him. And that's indeed what happened. He had a quarrel with the person in charge. He threatened resignation and he left. If you have a Laban in your life, don't just trust to your own wits alone. Trust in God. Keep praying to God who cares for you, who is just. And God will make things right for you sooner or later.
Let's pray. God our Father, you look with compassion on your people who suffer unjust laws or under unfair conditions. You will make things right for your chosen ones who cry out to you day and night. We pray for our brothers and sisters in North Korea and Pakistan. Lord, have compassion on your servants. Satisfy us in the morning with your unfailing love. We pray particularly for the needs of the people of Beirut and our partner churches in Lebanon. Make us glad for as many days as you have afflicted us, for as many years as we have seen trouble. We pray for those who are anxious about university places. Help them to place their anxieties on you and trust you for their future. Give justice to those who have unfairly lost their place. May your deeds be shown to your servants, your splendour to their children. May our hopes always be rooted in our faith in Jesus. Give us the assurance that you are with us and that you always hear the prayers that we make through our Lord Jesus, who taught us to pray like this. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory for ever. Amen. Glorious things of thee are spoken, Zion, city of our God. He whose word cannot be broken, formed thee for his own abode. On the rock of ages founded, what can shake thy sure repose? With salvation's walls surrounded, thou mayest smile at all thy foes. See the streams of living waters springing from the eternal love. Well, supply thy sons and daughters, and all fear of want remove. Who can faint while such a river ever flows their thirst to assuage? Grace which, like the Lord, the giver never fails from age to Round each habitation hovering, see the cloud and fire appear for a glory and a covering, showing that the Lord is near, thus deriving from their banner, light by night and shade. By day, safe they feed upon the manna which he gives them when they pray. Savior, if of Zion City, I through grace a member am. Let the world.
May those who trust the Lord be like Mount Zion, that cannot be shaken and endures forever. May that same Lord strengthen you in the good news of Christ, so that through your witness people might believe and obey him. And may the blessing of God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit, be with you now and always. Amen.